Well, hello, everyone. Uh, good day to you, I guess. Good afternoon. Um, happy to have you here. As I just said, uh, welcome. My name is Anna Barber, and I am the curator of exhibitions and programs here at the Martha's Vineyard Museum. And today we are once again joined by research librarian Bo Van Riper, who is going to take us on another journey into the collections and share with us the hidden histories, the untold stories, and the surprising finds within the museum's archives that tell the story of our island. Before we begin, uh, I would like to mention another program series that the museum is offering. This is our last hidden collections for a, a while. Um, we are letting Bo take a bit of a breather, um, whatever that means these days. And, uh, and we're going to press pause on the hidden collections for this summer and evaluate whether or not we're going to offer them again in the fall. So if you all have feedback on whether or not you would like to see this series continue in the fall, let us know either in the chat or send us an email um, because uh, we, we would like to know. Um, but in the interim, if you, if you need to get your bow fixed in the next couple of months, he's, he's certainly not going away. Uh, we are doing another program series um, called One Island Many Stories. And uh, this monthly series explores the exhibits, the permanent exhibit in, um, uh, at the museum called One Island Many Stories. So it parallels that exhibit, um, which explores seven themes on the island. And that is um, changing, voyaging, belonging, creating, my goodness, farming, fishing, and I'm forgetting the last one. Um, so this coming month on Thursday, the 20th at 4 p.m., Bo will be talking with Ian Ridgway, who is past captain of the Shenandoah and founder of Fuel, which is the foundation for underway experiential learning on the theme of voyaging. So far, we've done a couple of these programs and they're really fascinating. We would love to have you join us for that. The following month in June, um, we're gonna be joined by Alexis Morais, who is an activist, tribal historic preservation officer and vice president of the Chappaquiddick tribe of the Wampanoag Nation nonprofit, and she will be talking with Bo about the theme of belonging. Um, they will be fascinating discussions, and you can learn more and register on our website. Um, so we do, we love being able to offer programming, especially free programs like the one um, that we're here today gathering around for, um, and we rely on your support to help us keep these programs going. I know a lot of you who are joining us are regulars, and we are so thankful for just your participation, your being there, your feedback, and also if you are a member for your membership. Um, we, we couldn't do the things that we do without your help and your support, so we're looking forward to what the future brings and um, and thank you for all of that. So before I turn it over to Bo, just want to remind you um, that feel free to post questions uh, in the ch in the chat box in the Q&A box at any time during the talk and I'll field them over to Bo at the end. Um, we'll leave a little room at the end to talk. Um, and with that, I will pass it on over to Mr. Bo Van Riper. Hello. Hello and thank you as always for that wonderful introduction. And greetings, everybody. Welcome to the May round of Hidden Collections. Um, those of you of a certain age may remember this document. This was how you made auto reservations back in the great before when the internet was just a flicker in Sir Tim Berners-Lee's imagination and the world ran on a steady flow of paper back and forth between you and the businesses you patronized. Um, notice that this has to be handed in at a steamship authority terminal um, or mailed in with a check or money order. Remember money orders? Um, the steamship authority was not yet set up to handle credit cards in these days. Um, this is a two-part self-carboning piece of paper, and they would have taken your reservation, kept, one kept the white copy, handed you the yellow copy, and off you go. Um, I mentioned this by way of noting that this era of reservation making and the equivalent era of paper plane tickets and so on and so forth was far less long ago than we think. Um, 
And it's an illustration of a larger point. This is me putting on my historian of technology hat for about 10 seconds, which is that on top of all the things that we associate with the digital revolution, video calling, Facebook, and a million other high visibility things like that, the opportunity to watch three entire seasons of The Crown in a single weekend, if that's your jam, the digital revolution also revolutionized a thousand mundane transactions like making your auto reservation, which is now as easy as clicking a few boxes on a screen and having your computer pre-fill your credit card number. Before we leave this document though, I, which ironically I purchased on eBay and donated to the museum, um, I want to call your attention to one line in particular. Next slide, please. Staterooms available on steamers, $5. They are at the bottom right corner. Now, there are two things to notice about this. Steamers was in the 1960s era when this document was printed a meaningful distinction because in those days, the Steamship Authority, as it was called and still is, ran four different boats, the Islander, the Uncatina, the Nantucket as she was known then, later she was renamed the Nashon when the current Nantucket still in service came on the line in 74, and the old Nobska, the last of the sharp bowed tall stack side-loading steamers of the 1920s Great White Fleet, the last of that first group of boats that had been designed with automobile traffic in mind. The Nashon, pardon me, the Nantucket, later the Nashon, and the Nobsco were genuine steamers. That is to say, the propellers were turned by oil-burning steam engines deep in their hulls. The Islander and the Uncatina were the wave of the future. Modern diesel-powered ferries with a door at each end, drive in one end, drive out the other, basically a floating bridge with an engine attached that moved you and your car and the cars of your couple of dozen closest friends across Vineyard Sound. The steamers, Nobska from the 1920s and Nantucket, later Nashon from 1957, were in multiple ways, not just their steam engines, relics of an earlier era. They reflected a time when New Bedford was the principal port of embarkation for the islands. And when a voyage from New Bedford to Nantucket could be a significant investment of hours, which was why they, they were built with staterooms, small, small enclosed spaces with a door that closed you off from the rest of the world and a couple of couches and a table where you could put your feet up, play cards, relax, chat with your friends or family members or lean your head on your, on your carry-on bag and take a quick nap as the steamer made its way through Buzzards Bay and Vineyard Sound. The Islander and the Uncatina and all the boats that followed them, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Island Home, Woods Hole, and so forth, were designed to be much more workaday vessels, more akin to a bus than to an ocean-going steamer. They didn't have staterooms. They had seats where you'd sit for the 45 minutes it took from Woods Hole to the vineyard or the hour and a half, two hours it took from Woods Hole to Nantucket. A year after, a few years after the Nantucket entered service in 1957, the old steam powered Nantucket, New Bedford was dropped from the Steamship Authority schedule. That's another story for another day. Um, and the staterooms became functionally obsolete. But since they were there, why not offer people the opportunity to book a private space to make their Woods Hold a Nantucket journey? if they wanted to pony up an extra five bucks. Nobska went all out of service in 1973. Nantucket, by then Nashon, went out of service in 1987. But long before then, selling staterooms had ceased to be a thing. 
they were like the steam engines themselves that drove the Nashon and the Nobska, a relic of another era that once gone was never coming back. Next slide, please. Speaking of relics of other eras, the schooner Alice S. Wentworth was by the 1930s among the last of what had been a fleet of thousands upon thousands of two and three and four masted schooners that plied the Atlantic coast of North America. It's said that the last commercial schooner to call at Vineyard Haven sailed away into history in the summer of 1943. I've never been able to document that conclusively, but certainly the Alice Wentworth, the beloved vessel of Captain Zeb Tilton of North Road and Chilmark, was one of the very last. Zeb was an independent operator and through the teens, the 20s and the 30s until failing health and failing eyesight and back taxes forced him onto the beach. He carried any load that he could get a contract for anywhere that the, anywhere up and down the coast of New England that the Alice could go. And it was said that the Alice with her shallow draft and huge sails could sail across the common at Falmouth on a heavy dew. He hauled bricks and lumber and stone and coal and was able to do so at a profit because that was the last refuge of the old sail-driven schooners. Cargoes that were high bulk, low value, and low, low urgency. If it needed to get there quickly, if it needed to get there with guaranteed safety, it was shipped by rail or by truck on the increasingly extensive networks of paved highways that crisscross southern New England. But if it was bulk cargo with, in no particular rush, a schooner could still, if you could find one, take it there quick, take it there not quicker, but cheaper than just about any other means of transportation. And so it was that Zeb eked out a living until such time as he had to hang up his, his captain's clothes and retire. But a group of wealthy vineyarders were determined that the Alice wouldn't die along with the rest of the coastal schooners. They clubbed together, formed Alice S. Wentworth Associates and bought her so that Captain Zeb can continue sailing her not necessarily in commercial service, but to keep the tradition of coastal schooners that had helped build maritime commerce in New England for 200 years and had made Vineyard Haven what it was as a town. This document from the Alice S. Wentworth Collection at the museum announces to shareholders and Alice S. Wentworth Associates that the rescheduled annual meeting would be held at Tisbury Wharf aboard the schooner on August 23rd, 1940. Business to be followed by lunch and a sail with Captain Zeb at the helm. Next slide. And next slide. Notably, one of the things that this, this announced was an event at Mr. Fenner's farm in Chilmark in which Thomas Hart Benton, the famous regionalist painter and summer resident of Chilmark for the past 20 years, would paint a picture of Zeb Tilton that would be auctioned off to benefit the American Red Cross. It says with Benton's national reputation as an artist and Captain Zeb's as a personality, the bidding should be keen and the painting of the picture should be interesting. Next slide, please. And here's the picture. Zeb Tilton looking probably as spruce as he ever did late in life, rendered in Thomas Hart Benton's trademark style and donated to the museum where it was exhibited two years ago in our Thomas Hart Benton retrospective. Zeb Tilton died in the early 1950s. The Alice Wentworth was sold north where she was tied up alongside Anthony's Pier 4 restaurant in Boston until finally in the 70s, she succumbed to age in a winter storm and sank at, her, sank at pier side. Bits of her were salvaged, but with the end of the Alice Wentworth, the days of commercial sale in Vineyard Sound 
were not just as a practical thing, but also as a matter of living memory essentially over. Next slide, please. This impressive looking certificate site records that Antone Prada Jr. of Edgartown is a past sachem of in good standing of the improved order of red men, having duly served as sachem of the Nunapog tribe, number 165, hunting grounds of Edgartown, and so on and so on and so on. This certificate exists not only in the archives of the museum, but at the intersection of two threads in 20th century American culture. Next slide. One of them was the enthusiasm of people of European descent, in this case, members of the local Vineyard Haven Campfire Girls, in the previous case, Antone Prada and the other members of the Improved Order of Red Men. In yet a third case, the individuals who played the Wampanoag characters in the historical pageants held by Luce's Pond in West Tisbury, and then by Lake Tashmu in the early 1910s. Dressing up as Native Americans had a history in this country, has a history in this country going back to colonial times when, for example, the Sons of Liberty disguised themselves as Mohawk warriors before boarding the tea ships in Boston Harbor and throwing tea over the side as, an, as a gesture of political protest. It is, as scholar Vine Deloria has noted in his book, Playing Indian, a profoundly complicated cultural expression bound up with Europe, people of European descent presumed by themselves cultural superiority to Native Americans with the myth that Native Americans were in the early 20th century a quote unquote banishing race and with a desire to simultaneously on the part of people of European descent as they saw it honor the legacy of Native Americans and yet by some kind of sympathetic magic participate in and partake of what they saw as admirable qualities in Native culture. That actual Native Americans did not, to put it mildly, see it the same way is an understatement. And the complexity of reactions to non-native peoples wearing native clothes today, much less specifically trying to impersonate individual Native Americans or generic Native Americans, is a far deeper and broader and more complex subject that I can, than I can get into here. But it coexisted in the improved order of red men with a second thread which was, next slide please, the late 19th and early 20th century proliferation of fraternal orders. Here, the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows, which is not to be confused with the Order of Good Fellows who hosted the reception for the 1902 Tisbury High School graduation in their meeting rooms in downtown Vineyard Haven which is in turn not to be confused with Goodfellas, which was a gangster movie by Martin Scorsese in the 1990s, but I digress. The Odd Fellows, the Improved Order of Red Men, the Good Fellows, the Elks, the Moose, the Eagles, the Freemasons, and on and on and on the list of late 19th century and 20th century fraternal orders went. The Vineyard alone, boasted a half a dozen or more fraternal orders at the height of the phenomenon in the early 20th century. Save for the Freemasons, virtually all of them are gone now, although service clubs like the Rotary and the Kiwanis, which are adjacent to the old fraternal orders, still persist. Fraternal orders were like 
European people of European descent impersonating Native Americans and adopting what they believe to be replicas of Native American clothing and language and ways of seeing the world, at least for ceremonial purposes. Is one of those cultural phenomena that from a 21st century perspective is hard to get your head around? The idea of joining a society with costumes and rituals and ceremonies and titles of office, every bit as arcane looking to an outsider as say the orders of British nobility, seems both at odds with our modern world and at odds with America's claim to be a profoundly egalitarian society. And yet it was a huge part of late 19th and early to mid 20th so century social life on the vineyard and in America as a whole. And to understand life on the island in those days is it's necessary to be able to put your mind in a world where Anton Prada Jr., the a second generation Portuguese immigrant, could assume the title of sachem of the Nunapog tribe, Nunapog being the Wampanoag name for what we call Edgartown, of um, the hunting grounds of Edgartown on the 30th day of the hot moon and not feel like he was performing some profoundly ridiculous act or where somebody like the owner of this impressive certificate could hang it on the wall of his office or living room and be not self-conscious but proud of his membership in the great national fellowship of odd fellows next slide please from the wildly baroquely elaborate to the absolutely understated, an invitation like a million other invitations. You're cordially invited to an open house to celebrate the holiday season and swearing in of Mrs. Shirley K. Frisch as county commission. We all get invitations like these, maybe they're not printed on an raised embossed card anymore, but this is routine stuff until you look at the date, December 16th, 1970. And you think about the history of women in American politics, particularly women in local American politics, outside of traditionally feminized roles like school board member. And you wonder to yourself, how High on, how early on the roster of women elected on officials on Martha's Vineyard was Mrs. Shirley K. Frisch? And the answer is tied for number one. When Shirley Frisch was elected to the Dukes County Commission in 1970, the same year that another woman whose name I did not think to look up and now regret, uh, was elected to the Gay Head Select Board, they became jointly the first two women to hold elected office anywhere in Dukes County. This 50 years after the agitations of the Blackwell family, some are residents of Chilmark and others, brought women the vote via the 19th Amendment. There would, of course, be other women elected to office in rapid succession. Cora Medeiros, Linda Marinelli, on down to Linda Lo Melinda Loberg and many others in our own century. But Shirley K. Frisch was one of the two first. And as understated as it was, this invitation was a quiet announcement of a political revolution in Dukes County. Next slide. Welcome to Camp McConaughey where you can sit on benches and the in the woodlands around a campfire and contemplate the mysteries of the universe. Or, next slide. Hold flag ceremonies on a plane overlooking Vineyard Sound. Or, next slide. Hang out at the Rustic Camp Clubhouse. 
And if that doesn't look like the summer camp that you went to growing up, there's probably a reason for that. Before it was acquired by the, by the Girl Scouts as Camp McConaughey, pardon me, before it was acquired by the YWCA as Camp McConaughey, this building was the McConaughey Hotel, built in the mid 1890s as one of those, woohoo, maybe I can create a fabulously successful resort development in the wilds of Martha's Vineyard business enterprises that unfolded by the dozens, the literal dozens, in the quarter century after Oak Bluffs was founded on the shores of Vineyard Sound, just across the street from the Camp Meeting Association. Unlike Oak Bluffs, unlike Bellevue Heights, unlike Lagoon Heights, unlike even Oklahoma, which certainly had its rough spots there on the Edgartown Vineyard Haven Road, the McConaughey development was a failure of spectacular proportions. Its story, which Chris Baer wrote a lovely bit about for his That Was Then column in the Times a couple of years ago, involved striking, striking imported, laborers imported from Italy, threats of arson, guests fleeing the hotel in the middle of the night, and a hotel that closed within months of opening and then lay empty and derelict for nearly a decade before the YWCA bought it up in about 1913 and make that lay dormant for about 20 years before the YWCA bought it up in about 20, 1913 and for a few short years ran a girls summer camp there on the shores of Vineyard Sound. The YWCA would eventually move to the shores of Vineyard Haven Harbor after World War I. There would be other summer camps, including the St. Pierre School of Sport, which opened off of Main Street in Vineyard Haven, and then in 1959 bought the closed Marine Hospital and operated it for another many decades. But it's fair to say that nobody who ever went to summer camp on the vineyard probably enjoyed as palatial a set of digs as those lucky YWCA girls in the years before World War I. Next slide. This, as you may notice in the text at the top, is pre-printed bill of sale form. And being a friendly sort of bill of sale form, it brings greetings to anybody to whom it might be presented to. It's specifically a bill of sale for a ship no points for guessing that given the, given the spot art at the top, or more particularly part of a ship. Next slide, please. By this bill of sale, Thomas Bradley of Vineyard Haven, the county of Dukes County, state of Massachusetts, listed as merchant. He was a retired sea captain who opened a series of stores in Main Street and Vineyard Haven, co-founded what's now the Martha's Vineyard Shipyard, was involved in a wide range of town enterprises and was the first person to try and develop a summer resort on the tip of West Shop. He was about a decade too early, but he made a heck of a go of it. Anyway, among the other hats Thomas Bradley wore was Marine Broker, and more about that in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. Thomas Bradley, foreign in consideration of the sum of 170 dollars and 54 cents, next slide, agrees to sell to John A. Swain of Tisbury, state aforesaid, etc. Next slide. One 128th part of the good ship Pocahontas. Congratulations, John A. Swain known when he was a boy in Denmark before he shipped out on, a, on his father's merchant vessel as Johan Anders Schoon. He got to America, jumped ship, was kidnapped by people who wanted to force him into service on their ship, escaped from them, got ashore, settled on Martha's Vineyard, married, raised a family, 
and became an American citizen, anglicizing Johann Andres Spoon to John Andrew Swain. John Andrew Swain, as of this moment in the 1840s, became the proud owner of one 128th of the whale ship Pocahontas, which was headquartered, which was home ported out of Tisbury. And you might ask yourself, what exactly does one 128th of a whaling ship consist of? I mean, do you get half the flying jib and part of the taffrail? Do you get three square feet of the captain's cabin and, and an oar off the port whaleboat? I mean, how does that even work? The answer, of course, is that one 128th of a whale ship is a purely notional thing. They can't point to this is the bit of the physical ship you own. It means that you own for that $147 one 128th share in the ship itself and one 128th share in the owner's profits from every voyage it makes while you are part owner. This was for middle class people like John Swain, the stock market of the 19th century. If you had a little extra money put aside and you wanted to invest it, people like Thomas Bradley, marine brokers, were there to look at how much money you were interested in investing and look at the available ships whose owners were looking to sell shares and say, well, for $147, Mr. Swain, I can get you one 128th part of the Pocahontas. Now, from Swain's point of view, this is a great deal. John Swain, tradesman, middle-class citizen of Tisbury, is never going to have enough money to own an entire whale ship all by himself just like I'm never going to have enough money to own Microsoft all by myself, which is just as well because I'm mostly an Apple guy. Um, but it's like I can afford a few shares of Microsoft. Swain could have afford a few, a small fraction of the Pocahontas. When Microsoft makes money, I make money. When, Swain, when the Pocahontas brings back a cargo of whale oil, worth close to a million bucks in today's money, Swain gets his relatively modest cut. His money, rather than being buried in a tin box in the flower garden or stuffed under his mattress, is at least working for him. Now, Swain's share of the Pocahontas was tiny, but we have many other similar fractional bills of sales for ships that are for a quarter of the ship, a 16th, a 32nd. And a, even a 16th of, a success, of the profits from a successful whaling voyage could easily repay your initial investment, which is why fractional ownership of whaling ships was popular for the little guy. And if you were a big time rich vineyard if you're Dr. Daniel Fisher or Captain Richard Luce with the big beautiful yellow house on William Street. Fractional ownership in whale ships was still a good idea. Better to own an eighth each of eight different ships or a quarter each of four different ships than all of one ship because whaling was a dangerous business. If all your money was invested in a single ship, then yeah, okay, you got the whole share of the owner's profits when the voyage was over. But if the ship sank or was wrecked or was burned by the Confederates or whatever, then you lost everything. If your money was spread over multiple ships, then you'd, you'd take a hit, but you wouldn't be wiped out. Diversifying your portfolio, 19th century vineyard style. Next slide, please. You may think that this is two boulders with a big flat boulder piled on top of it, and you'd be right. But since right around the turn of the last century, right around the early 1900s, <clears throat> 
this structure, which lies on private property south of South Road near the top of Quitsa Hill, now in considerably more overgrown than it is in this picture, has been called the Chilmark Dolmen or the Chilmark Cromlech, which associates it by the use of those terms of art with megalithic structures from Bronze Age Europe. Now, the fact that Bronze Age Europeans didn't show up here in what would become the county of Dukes County and go around building megalithic burial structures like dolmens and cromlechs that exist in Western Europe has not traditionally troubled people who use that, those terms to apply to this particular structure in Chilmark nor does the increasingly sketchy evidence of, no, sorry, not increasingly, extraordinarily sketchy evidence that the Norse made it anywhere in North America, south of Lonesome Meadow in Newfoundland, where we actually have archeological evidence on, of honest to goodness Norse settlements stopped people from saying, aha, mysterious stone structure, the Vikings built it. The Chilmark Cromlech or Dolmen or Root Cellar or Lawn Ornament, those theories have all have their advocates, um, has been referred to like a lot of other allegedly mysterious stone structures on the vineyard as an ancient Indian construction or an, it, or an ancient Viking construction for more than a century now. The fact that the Wampanoag have consistently said, nope, nothing our, nothing our people built. We don't build structures like that, never have. The fact that archeologists who have investigated it have said, Nope, not Viking. The Vikings didn't build anything like that. And besides, even if they did, they certainly didn't bury people in things like this. For starters, it's too small for a human burial. But next slide. Those realities, note the handy human figures for scale, don't stop it being fascinating and don't stop people from speculating and spinning romantic stories about Indians or long lost Bronze Age travelers or Vikings or for all I know, aliens from another dimension, moving these rocks around to create a mysterious structure in the hills of Chilmark. Because, next slide please. When it comes right down to it, romantic stories are fun and it's, it's entertaining to imagine Norse explorers tramping around in the hills of Chilmark, burying some fellow explorer on what's going to become the slopes of Quitsa Hill 500 years before Columbus. I mean, certainly Paul Lynch, funeral director back in the 1930s thought so, when he used the Cromlech of Quitsa to headline an advertising slip he came um, he handed out to clients. Whether or not Mr. Lynch, the funeral director, offered Cromlech burials as part of his panoply of services goes, alas, unrecorded in the historical record. Next slide, please. We think of the vineyard as an island with two newspapers now, the Martha's Vineyard Times, the Vineyard Gazette, and prior to the early 1980s when the Times was established as a one newspaper town. But if you spend much time poking around in the archives of the Martha's Vineyard Museum, you realize that that's far from the case. Before the Times, the island's second newspaper was the grapevine for roughly a decade between 1971 and 1981. And back in the years around 1900, there were multiple vineyard newspapers. The Cottage City Star, which morphed into the Martha's Vineyard Herald in 1882, having succeeded in its original goal of 
winning independence for Cottage City from Edgartown, the short-lived Vineyard News, Mr. Chick's Vineyard something or other, which I can't remember offhand, and other even shorter run papers like the Seagull, which was published an issue or two a year at West Tisbury in the 1890s. Until the advent of the Martha's Vineyard Times in the 1980s, the Martha's Vineyard Herald, whose publisher was responsible for the Civil War statue in Oak Bluffs, um, was, had the distinction of being the longest running paper on the island other than the Gazette. The Herald began publication after it took over from the Cottage City Star in 1882 and operated until it was bought out by the Gazette 40 years later in 1922, shortly after Henry and Elizabeth Huff took over as publishers of the Gazette. The Herald is, to be perfectly honest, not a particularly distinguished newspaper. Its four pages were awash in bizarre patent medicine advertisements, ads for New Bedford department stores, and anything else that the publishers thought could keep the lights on and the press turning. But if you look in the margins of, say, a random issue from the summer of 1891, you can learn a lot about the vineyard 130 years ago. Next slide, please. You could learn, for example, that the vineyard was cosmopolitan enough that the second string newspaper on the island could use a French motto and expect that people would know what the heck it was talking about, unlike me. Next slide, please. If you thumb through the four text pack pages of this particular August issue, 1891 of the Martha's Vineyard Herald, you'd find that the West Chop Steamboat Company was operating between the wharf at the tip of West Chop. The first successful summer colony on West Chop had been founded two years earlier in 1889. And why the heck would you take the long bumpy carriage ride into downtown Vineyard Haven to catch the steamer if you could just wait and catch the steamer right outside your summer house at the tip of Oak Bluffs? What's more, the West Chop Steamboat Company wanted you to know its little steamer city of Portsmouth, after crossing Vineyard Sound in only 30 minutes, head start after all for the, for the ones that started up at the head of the harbor, it could connect you with the old colony railroad trains that came right to the dock in Woods Hole and ran to Boston. You could even, if you timed it right, catch the special Old Colony Express known as the Flying Dude, which if you caught it early at Woods Hole could take you up for a five and a half hour day in Boston and bring you back in time to catch the city of Portsmouth home to West Chop that same evening. Next slide, please. You could learn from that same issue of the, of the Martha's Vineyard Times that the brand new palatial steamer Portland would leave India Wharf from Boston every evening, headed up to Portland, Maine, and that you could therefore, having hopped the steamer to Woods Hole and the train up to Boston, have, have easy access to Portland and all the vacation areas along the main coast if you ever got tired of West Chop. Other ads elsewhere in the paper reminded you that other steamers linking Boston and Portland and New York called at the wharf and Oak Bluffs at the foot of New York Avenue and you had but to consult the ticket office at the wharf if you wanted to buy a ticket on one of them to point north or point south. Next slide, please. The 1891 Herald would tell you that the Martha's Vineyard Railroad, then in approaching its 20th year in operation, it had opened in 1874, would leave Edgartown for Oak Bluffs multiple times a day and would run on to Katama where the Mattachesant Lodge and its clam bake pavilion await you. Mind you, no excursion tickets sold on the train. Next slide, please. 
It would remind you that if you're coming to Cottage City and you wanted to save a few minutes getting yourself and your, and your baggage into the campground, that you should get off at the Highland Wharf, where the East Chop Beach Club is now, because from there, the Cottage City Street Railway Company, with its horse trolleys, would run every 20 minutes up along the edge of what's now, of what's now the park in front of the ocean view, across the bridge between Lake Anthony, now Oak Bluffs Harbor and Sunset Lake, and up Siloam Avenue into Trinity Park itself, where it would make a circle around the tabernacle. If you look closely, you can still see the rails. And then leave you off within easy walking distance of your, of your cottage. Next slide, please. The street railways, the horse railways, would in time vanish, replaced first by the electric trolleys that had a brief heyday in the late 1890s, the early 1900s, and then by jitney buses like the jovially named 20th Century Limited here that ran between Edgartown and Oak Bluffs. Next slide, please. The Seaview House, where the Martha's Vineyard Railroad turned around on a Y track built right on the wharf, would burn in the fall, would burn a year later in September of 1892, taking the Y track with it and forcing the Martha's Vineyard Railroad for the rest of, for the relatively brief rest of its existence to run in reverse every trip from Oak Bluffs to Edgartown and forward only coming back from Edgartown to Oak Bluffs because it no longer had a way to turn around. The railroad was, too, was in too dire financial straits by then, 1892, to rebuild the Y track and avoid that indignity. The same fire that destroyed the Seaview House would destroy the giant roller skating rink across Oak Bluffs Avenue that I mentioned in a previous version of Hidden Collections. The railroad itself would go bankrupt in 1896, the tracks torn up for scrap, the locomotive barged off island, notwithstanding persistent rumors that it was slathered in cosmoline, wrapped in tarpaulin and tarpaulins and buried under Wabin Park over to, off Tawanakut Avenue in a sand hill somewhere else on the island or in somebody's back garden, depending on who you ask. Um, Next slide, please. The steamer, port, the steamer city of Portsmouth, which ran out of West Chop, would be condemned in the mid 19, in the mid 1890s, and the West Chop stop would briefly be taken over by the New Bedford, wait for it, New Bedford Woods Hole, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket Steamboat Company, which made the runs from New Bedford to Nantucket, stopping at Cottage City, Woods Hole, and Vineyard Haven on the way. The Portland, the pride of the North of Boston steamer run, would be lost with all hands and all passengers in the November gale of 1898. And in time, big side wheel steamers like the Portland would be replaced first by screw steamers and then by the railways. 1891 was, although nobody knew it at the time, a moment, one of those moments when as in 1946, when the first double-ended ferry came onto the Woods Hole to Vineyard Haven run. A moment when the vineyard was poised in the beginning of a new era. Somebody looking around at the vineyard that lay beyond them when they were reading that August issue with the Martha's Vineyard Herald would, if they came back a decade later, let alone a century, let alone 130 years later, barely recognize the island that they'd been looking at in 1891. But they would recognize the Harborview Hotel on Starbucks Neck in Edgartown, open for the first time two months earlier, June 15th, 1891. The first successful resort hotel in Edgartown, and as Nis Kildegard put it in his book about the business, the hotel that saved a town. 
setting Edgartown finally after 25 years of trying on the road to becoming a summer resort and pulling it out of the economic doldrums it had plunged into in the 1870s as the whaling industry began to slowly circle the drain. The harbor view is still with us, even if the city of Portsmouth and the Portland and coastal steamers calling at the foot of New York Avenue and horse cars through Trinity Park aren't. The history of the vineyard is like the history of every place, a story of change and continuity and both the changes and the continuities sometimes turn up in unexpected and overlapping combinations, as in this issue with Aaron. Next slide, please. This is the Pawnee House, once one of the many big resort hotels in Oak Bluffs. As you walked up Circuit Avenue from the base where the flying horses were, you'd pass five big hotels even before you got to where Linda Jeans is now. Next slide, please. The Pawnee was known for its balconies, for its band concerts, for its palatial rooms, for its gas lighting and then electric lighting, and for offering plush accommodations at a reasonable price. More, say, Hampton Inn than Hilton, let alone Ritz. But all flesh is grass and all business models are subject to change. As, late, as early as 1936, it was apparent that the old model of long stay tourists delivered by railroads to the railroads to the edge of the water at New Bedford and Woods Hole, carrying steamer trunks and moving into hotels for weeks or months or a season at a time were no longer the face of the future. The Pawnee House shut down in 1936, but, 19, next slide please. Reopened a decade later after, as the Gazette put it, a 10 year closing. That one of those lively, one of the liveliest spots of the gay 90s, the Gazette proudly proclaimed is reopening and will operate under as a rooming house with attractive rooms available at reasonable rates and the old dining room remodeled remodeled into a cafeteria capable of seating 180 people. In the rear of the building, the old annexes lightly built, the Gazette said dismissively, their polite way of saying cheap and a little bit shabby around the edges had been torn down <clears throat> and replaced by a paved lot for guests to park their cars. Nobody knew it quite yet, but the Gazette had buried the lead. The need for a graded paved parking area was the Pawnee acknowledgement of a new reality that was sweeping over the island in 1946. The new face of tourism came a week at a time or a long weekend at a time and it came not by rail to the edges of the of the mainland with steamer trunks unloaded onto the platform. It came in a Buick or a Mercury or a Chevrolet or a Ford rolling onto the ferries including the new ancient wheezing bought from an Hudson River Ferry Company, which had built it in the early years of the century. Islander, the first double-ended ferry on the Martha's Vineyard run. And they carried their suitcases in the trunk of their own car, intending to find inexpensive accommodations that didn't come with prepaid meals or plush parlors or elaborate dining rooms intending to eat out at clam shacks and perhaps have breakfast at the diner at the waterfront. They came by car and those cars needed parking spaces. The Pawnee, next slide please, made a valiant go of it in their new model for seven more years 
but their pledge that they would be opening Saturday, June 29th for the season and many seasons to come turned out not to be the case. In 1953, the Pawnee was shut down for good as a rooming house. The top three floors were demolished. The back parking lot was filled in with single story brick and cinder block shop fronts. And the former lobby and public spaces in the front were converted into more shop fronts. Today, you know the front, the old public rooms of the Pawnee House is Ben and Bill's and East Away and other well-known Circuit Avenue shops. You know the former lightly built annexes turned parking lot as Be Strong Gym and a restaurant that in its latest incarnation was named the Pawnee House in honor of that grand old four-story relic of the gay 90s. Next, next slide, please. Recognize it? That's Stan Murphy learning how to be a painter circa 1948, fresh back from World War II, fresh out of art school, at the beginning of what would be a long distinguished career. But what I want to call your attention to is not the way his figures hover between Picasso white and New Yorker cartoon and kindergarten child's fever dream of a color scheme, but at the little lightly sketched brown details here and there, the shot glass and the bar flies hand, the bar stools, over the barkeep's left elbow, the details around whatever that black thing that looks like a taper towel holder is on the bar. Details sketched in, but left unfinished. Stan evidently deciding that they didn't necessarily belong in whatever the final picture was gonna look like. Next slide. Here's Stan nearly more than 30 years later doing a study of Claire Dyes, one of his neighbors with her violin, for a preliminary shot at a, much larger, at a much larger and more finished work. And here, next slide, is Stan around the same time sketching Ozzy, or as he put it at the top, Ozzy Fisher, um, up island farmer and friend to animals, leaner on stone walls, carrier on of the island's agricultural tradition. Again, rough sketches and again, stray vertical and horizontal lines like the one on the stone wall in the larger of the two sketches to the left of Ozzy in his bucket. Next slide, please. Here's Stan doing a quick pencil sketch of a landscape, writing notes to himself about what he's seeing as he's looking at it. So that later in his studio, looking at this pencil sketch, planning out the painting it'll become, he can remind himself what he was seeing, where the mass of the picture should be, how the trees looked, what the color values were, an aid de memoir to go with that I for color and light and shading and balance that all great artists, Stan Murphy, Alan Whiting, and so on and so forth, develop about the landscape. Next slide, please. Stan, again, envisioning Fred Fisher at his farm in West Tisbury in a rare, in a rare moment of repose as a pig sniffs his boot. Again, the grid lines, again, the sense of trying out ideas in the rough sketch that will later emerge into the finished painting. One of the exhibits on the museum's calendar for years to come is a retrospective of Stan's work drawing on the large collection of drawings and paintings and sketches and preliminary studies like these that were given to us by Stan's family after he passed away. And part of what I love about working in a museum is a chance to see here through Stan's work, 
the work behind the finished work and to be reminded that even artists of Stan Murphy's stature and talent and distinction don't just go from an idea to a finished painting, that there are stages along the way, just as there are drafts in a piece of writing, just as there are false starts in a chair or a cabinet that you're building or a sculpture that you're carving or a cake that you're trying to figure out how to bake just perfectly. One of the things that the Stan Murphy collection here at the museum preserves is not just Stan's finished work, but the way he worked, the way he got to the beautiful, evocative, finished images of vin the vineyard and of vineyarders that have been his legacy for us and for generations to come. So with that thought, I wanna leave you next slide with one example of Stan Murphy's finished work. It is, of course, the summer mural from the Catherine Cornell Theater in the Tisbury Town Hall. And say to all of you, have a beautiful, exuberant summer, whether you spend it in the yellow bikini on the shores of Cow Bay or someplace else doing something else. Um, come see the museum. We've got awesome exhibits opening over the next month and through the summer. And I will see you all in the ether and hopefully soon in person. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Bo. Oh, it's a, it's a little sad to think that this is the end of um, at least just this first round of, <clears throat> excuse me, programs that you have offered. It's, it's so wonderful to learn about this collection. Uh, see some old favorites and learn so much new. Uh, we have just a couple of questions and, I, and I, we're going to wrap it up fairly quickly because um, I know you all have things to do as well. But if we could talk for a second, and I actually don't know this either. There are a couple of questions from Gail and Judith who wanted to know about the Zeb Tilton painting. If we know one, who won the, the, the bid for it and how much did they pay? I, I, do you know off the top of your head? I don't, and that's an awesome question. Um, given that we have the date that it was supposed to be painted, we can, it's probably, the answer to who is probably findable in the Gazette. And whether the Gazette would be too circumspect to say how much, or whether since it was for charity, they'd have included that detail in order to say, you know, who, who this person did something great for the Red Cross. I don't know, but I, I would love to know, as I'm sure many people would, what an original Tom Benton went for in 1941. <laughs> so we received them in the collection in 1976. And what's interesting is that this was a, this, and the paint, the other painting we have in our collection of his that he did of Josie West were bequests. So whoever purchased this painting, it ended up back with Benton at some point, and then he left it to us after he died. So there's an interesting story to uncover there. So thanks to both of you for for um, bring that to our attention. Maybe we'll, we'll track down some answers. So the last question is um, from Judith, who's taking us all the way back to the very beginning uh, and, the, and the, the beautiful state rooms. And she wanted to know how long, during the era of the, those state rooms, how long did the journey take? My recollection, and keep in mind that this is without having actually looked it up. But my recollection is that in one of the old steamers like the Nobska, New Bedford to Nantucket would have shot the life out of five hours. Uh, I may be wrong, that may be a little bit long. Um, and again, my recollection is that Woods Hole to Nantucket on one of the old steamers was about half of that maybe 
two and a quarter hours altogether. Um, but again, that's without recourse to a book. So I may be, I may be off. It was definitely a stateroom in the sense of a private compartment on a train rather than the stateroom in the sense of you kick your shoes off and put your feet up on the bunk and so on and so forth. Um, and the one picture of I've seen of the interior of a stateroom on the Nantucket that became the Nashon is pretty darn Spartan. It's not wood paneling and and Persian carpets by a long stretch. It's like the uh, the waiting room of a really in, undistinguished doctor's office. Oh, I'll take a picture. It really takes away some of that romance right there. Um, maybe like this office that I am in in this program right now. Um, well, anyway, to all of you who are still with us, Thank you, and thank you for your comments about um, continuing these programs. We are noting all of them. And again, we appreciate all your support. Please continue to um, check our website and sign up for our weekly emails as we're doing all sorts of wonderful things. And as Bo mentioned, we are opening a whole slew of exhibits. So if you're on Island or will be soon, please come and visit us. We'd love to see you safely in person now as we continue to think about the summer and starting to do our programs in person once again, which I'm just so thrilled to be able to say that. So in the meantime, thank you, Bo. Thanks to all of you. Stay safe, stay well, and we hope to see you around the museum. Thank you so much.